With Cunard's new ship stealing all the glory, Bruce Ismay, the chairman of White Star Line, decided to beat Cunard at its own game, not with two, but three giant liners. And with J.P. Morgan's money, Ismay didn't have to seek any government handout. But Ismay decided, I'm going to have the best ships ever. I want the biggest, grandest ships that anyone ever had. I want to be the best. At Harland and Wolfe's Belfast Yard, in mid-December 1908, the largest army of ship workers ever assembled began construction of not one, but two giant hulls side by side. Their names, the Olympic and the Titanic. A third ship, gigantic, would follow. Olympic led the way. Titanic mirrored her progress three months behind. The entire project created enormous international interest, especially from rival yards. Intriguingly, the entire construction was documented by German cameramen. At more than 45,000 tons and 850 feet in length, the two White Star Giants were one and a half times the size of their rivals, Mauritania and Lusitania. With the Olympic billed as the largest ship in the world, White Star needed a new publicity slogan for the slightly larger Titanic. Titanic, they proclaimed, was virtually unsinkable, the largest and safest liner in the world. She was the last word in luxury. Money literally was no object on the interior fitting in the ship. She was designed to do exactly uh, as Esme wanted to be, to be a floating palace. To be the very last word in, in ship design, in innovation, in technology and in outfit. For a fleeting moment, Ismay's dream had become a reality. But even he could never have imagined the impact that the Titanic would have on her time and history. Not for her size or her grandeur, but for the tragedy that was about to unfold. A tragedy that would touch the lives of so many people, even in the remotest corners of the globe. Seventy miles to the northeast of Beirut, perched high on a mountaintop, lies the Lebanese village of Kafar Mishki. In 1911, dreaming of a better life across the Atlantic, a group of villagers made plans to set out by mule for the coast of France. One man who planned to emigrate was Elias Alcicli, now 110 years old. From as early as I can remember, about a hundred years ago, people would leave the village. They traveled in order to earn more money and build their future. At the last moment, Elias decided not to leave his small village. He and the townspeople bid farewell to the party as they set out to the French port of Cherbourg to wait with other immigrants from all over Europe for a ship to the New World. In the port building, the group struggled to be understood. Without proper documentation, their names weren't recorded correctly on the passenger list. The vessel they boarded by chance was no ordinary ship. She was Titanic, the world's largest ocean liner, on her maiden voyage from Southampton. With one last port of call before setting out across the Atlantic to New York. southern coast of Ireland, another group of passengers awaited Titanic's arrival. What do you think of it? I don't know what to think. It gives me the shivers. The biggest one thing, that, 
hasn't seemed small enough, no doubt, when we're a thousand miles from any land and nothing but the great ocean all around. You've been to sea before, then? I haven't. Me neither. It was clear weather, of course, and it was also flat calm. But she was on a maiden voyage, and the important thing was that she had to be in New York on schedule. They couldn't afford to be late for such a maiden arrival. And so, although they were aware of the fact that there was ice ahead, she was going too fast. That was the problem. Christ. been advertised as a, a ship that was practically unsinkable. For some reason, uh, many people have forgotten the word practically. But anything that's big enough, heavy enough, with a hole in it that's full of water will sink. In 12 lethal seconds, the iceberg had mortally wounded Titanic. As the captain gave word to abandon ship, he knew full well the liner was doomed and that there were only enough lifeboats for half the souls on board. The awful thing about Titanic and the old ships was that the first-class country was amidships and up high, and that's where all the lifeboats were. The steerage passengers were in the hull, forward and aft, and lifeboats were not within their ken. So when the disaster came, they didn't know where to go. They, they had no idea of the geography, and there were still stewards on the Titanic as the ship was starting to go down who were trying to keep the barriers up and keep the steerage passengers out of first-class country. It was classically a case of first class went first and second class went second, and the poor third class had no place at all to go. And of course, on top of it, coupled with the fact that the poor Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats anyway, made it all the worse. Two hours after the collision, Titanic sank two miles down to her final resting place. morning, crowds of New Yorkers converged on the White Star office eager for news. First reports were confused. One newspaper ran a headline claiming all were saved and the Titanic was taken in tow by another liner. The city of Southampton stopped at the news. One by one, the facts filtered through to a stunned world. Of the 2,207 passengers and crew on board, Two-thirds were believed lost, including the captain. One of the survivors, it was announced, was Bruce Ismay, the chairman of White Star. The news of the tragedy took more than three months to reach Kifar Mishki. Only one woman survived. If she had died, we would never have heard the truth, because our friends were not on the passenger list. Titanic's builders, Harland and Wolf, lost eight of its employees in the disaster, including its chief designer, Thomas Andrews. It was just numbed horror. Guys who had spent their life working on Titanic had seen it grow from, from a simple plate to a, a living creature, if you like, put their heart and soul into it. 
couldn't believe it had gone. It really, it, it brought you up short. Soon you realise just that, that really human beings are fallible and nothing is permanent. At the official inquiry, Harland and Wolf were exonerated and the quality of its workmanship praised. But the inquiry severely questioned the safety rules of the day, dictated by the Board of Trade, especially the provisioning of lifeboats. During the building of the liners, Chief Designer Thomas Andrews supervised their construction using a single set of plans for both ships. You don't draw the ship twice. You do the drawings for the prototype, which were Olympic. But on the master drawings, he would have changed the drawings using a very thick red ink fountain pen. What he wanted changed for Titanic. Andrews also kept a small notebook in which he meticulously detailed every aspect of the construction. Modifications were made in red, a change to cornices here, to light fittings there. And it's in this small book, forgotten for all these years, that a new detail in the Titanic story comes to light. Harland and Wolfe had designed both ships with not only enough lifeboats to accommodate more than 3,500 people, but with spare capacity for a further 65 passengers. But on an adjacent page, the portentous red ink, the lifeboat capacity for the liners had been decimated in the stroke of a pen. But on whose instructions? Lifeboats were seen in those days as uh, necessary evil. They didn't particularly like them because they spoiled the nice look of your ship. So the owner decided the ship would carry the minimum number of lifeboats to have a cleaner line on the ship. The boats wouldn't be stacked three and four deep. If there was a positive legacy of the Titanic disaster, it was the effect on safety at sea. The law was changed to ensure a place in a lifeboat for all souls on board, irrespective of class. The loss of the Titanic had an extraordinary effect on British morale. Dozens of memorials were dedicated across Britain to mourn the victims. And the end of the public's trust in money, machinery and power. But many people felt that the sinking of the Titanic, a mechanical marvel, unsinkable, going down on its maiden trip, was actually the beginning of the end, the slow decline of the British Empire. So it was a very symbolic act beyond just the ship and White Star and liners. It was a kind of political event in a sense. Castles of the Sea is sponsored in part by Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most, and by Meridian Vineyards. In Britain, there was the motor car and flying machines and a new king and queen. But the new king, George V, was distracted too. And like his father, the distraction was his royal cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. In 1913, King George visits Berlin and rides through the streets with his cousin. The Kaiser's speech is tinged with peaceful platitudes. But behind the scenes, Germany presents a different picture. In the great industrial cauldron of the Rhine, in the huge foundries of crops at Essen, thousands of workers roll gun barrels off the production lines. Strength for building for a test of strength. Every gun barrel that rolled off and every ship launched seemed to darken the clouds of war which hung over Europe. And it could only mean to, to one purpose, so that was Germany challenging the Royal Navy's hegemony at sea. So it was all fairly clearly coming. The peace-loving director of the Hamburg-America line, Albert Ballin, argued passionately with his friend, the Kaiser, 
to let the growing rivalry between Germany and Britain be a duel of the great ships of White Star and Hamburg America, not ships of war. Only weeks after the shock of Titanic sinking, the Kaiser launched a new Imperial flagship for Balin's Hamburg America line, Imperator. She was the first ship ever to exceed 50,000 tons, and her impressive eagle figurehead gave her just enough added length to propel her into the record books as the longest ship ever built. Carrying 4,500 passengers, the Imperator was the first of a trio of superliners Ballin hoped would devastate his Atlantic competition. A year later, in 1913, came Vaterland, larger again, with berths for nearly 2,500 immigrants. Both ships reached new heights in ocean-going luxury. Imperator's Pompeian bath was the most sensational facility of its kind ever to go to sea. The first-class passengers were the icing on the cake. They were the ones who had the most beautiful cabins. First class had two-thirds of the ship, but four-fifths of the people who went on the ships were crowded into one-fifth of the space as immigrants. They paid for those great liners. Every year, tens of thousands of people escaping poverty and persecution would arrive in Hamburg from across Europe looking for passage to the new world. Many had heard of Hamburg America's thoughtful treatment of immigrants. Albert Ballen had created a complete village where immigrants could be housed for up to two weeks before sailing. It was fully equipped with a clinic and fumigation center to ensure disease-free passengers. Even the most minor diseases could result in their rejection in America. A resident brass band bade farewell as the travelers set off to join their westbound liners. In turn, Ballin hoped many a happy immigrant would sing the liner's praises to relatives and acquaintances who were to follow. In 1914, Kaiser Wilhelm launched the third and largest member of Ballin's trio of superliners, Bismarck. Conceived in a world of peace, Bismarck was launched into a world only days away from Armageddon. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was assassinated in Sarajevo by Serbian nationalists. Decades of tension, Germany and Britain were finally at war. A war that would be unprecedented in its violence, destruction, and scope. At the outbreak of hostilities, Germany radioed its merchant ships, ordering them to a war footing. Like Britain, Germany had built its liners for rapid conversion to auxiliary cruisers. For more than a decade, German liner captains had carried secret orders, advising them to quickly return to Germany in the event of war. But the early days were a disaster for the Kaiser. Only five liners at sea made it back to Germany to carry out conversion. 37 potential ships of war found themselves impounded in neutral ports. Vaterland was preparing to sail from New York when she received word that French and British cruisers were waiting to intercept her on the Atlantic. Hamburg America ordered Vaterland to remain in New York and await further instructions. A few days later, she was unofficially impounded by the United States. 
One of the few German ships converted was the first German Atlantic Blue Ribbon holder, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grasse. After only three weeks in service, a British cruiser cornered her coaling in an African port. Both ships opened fire. Ironically, the ocean liner that first marked the growing rivalry between Britain and Germany two decades earlier was one of the first casualties of the war. on the old head of Kinsale on the southern coast of Ireland had been a welcome sight after an often perilous crossing of the North Atlantic by ocean liner. Today, it marks the nearest landfall to the scene of the most dramatic and controversial maritime disaster of the century. Twelve miles offshore in waters 300 feet deep lies the wreck of Lusitania, one of the greatest passenger ships of her time. Her sinking by a German U-boat in the first year of World War I shocked the world. But Lusitania was not merely a casualty of war. She was a victim of an extraordinary rivalry that had brought about her very existence. of hostilities, Winston Churchill, British First Lord of the Admiralty, ordered his navy to blockade Germany. His aim? To starve the enemy into submission. As well as having the world's largest navy at his disposal, Churchill requisitioned scores of ocean liners for war duties. And Winston Churchill, who was First Lord of the Admiralty, was determined that he had this sort of extra fleet at its command, which would be the armed merchant cruisers. The two Cunard giants, Mauritania and Lusitania, had been subsidized by the government for precisely this purpose. But the Admiralty overlooked Lusitania and called up the newer Aquitania. Completed only months before the war, Aquitania was designed as a comfortable, luxurious vessel for the transatlantic run. With guns mounted, exteriors painted gray, and splendid interiors stripped bare, Aquitania and Mauritania were transformed into the fastest auxiliary cruisers on the high seas. But almost immediately, Churchill discovered that the giant Cunarders were totally unsuited for the job. Well, he made a discovery that his planners hadn't told him, that within three weeks, there wasn't a scrap of coal left in the Admiralty bunker. They'd drained all the coal that these ships are very expensive to run. Impractical as auxiliary cruisers, Aquitania and Mauritania were dispatched to other, more appropriate war duties as troop ships. Overnight, the fleet of passenger liners that had linked the British Empire in peace had been transformed for trooping duties. With their enormous passenger carrying capacity, ocean liners would prove to be of great strategic importance in the war against Germany, and they would help accelerate the spread of war to a global scale. 
hundreds of thousands of eager soldiers from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and South Africa set out on a voyage of a lifetime to the front lines of Europe and North Africa. The potential to move troops around by sea isn't just a function of the great liners. We did it with sail and wood throughout the 19th century. We had from the East India Company on in India, and we carried troops to India by the long route to South Africa by the long routes. But steam and metal transformed that with the rapidity with which you could move them and the scale on which you could move them. The first ocean-going liner to carry troops was the Great Britain. In the mid-1850s, she was converted to transport 1,650 soldiers and 30 horses to the Crimean War. At the end of the 19th century, Empire troops voyaged from Australia to South Africa to fight in the Boer War. But ocean liners served in other wartime roles. Requisitioned as troop transport vessels on the way to battle, they often returned as hospital ships. Dining rooms were converted to bring home the wounded, sick, and even the dead. Wearing the distinguishing Red Cross colors, a ship could claim protection under the Geneva Convention and theoretically become a sanctuary from the carnage. As the war escalated, the British government actively encouraged Cunard to maintain a regular passenger service across the Atlantic. The giant Cunarder, Lusitania, had avoided war duties so far. Unlike her fleet mates, Mauritania and Aquitania, her cabins and public rooms had not been stripped bare for bunks and war supplies. As long as they were paying passengers, the sound of champagne corks and a palm cord orchestra would continue to drown out thoughts of war. But by 1915, the sea lanes around Britain were the most dangerous in the world. In retaliation for the blockade of her shores, Germany had declared the waters around Britain a war zone, and every ship met in the zone would be sunk without warning. Saturday morning in New York. It was May 1st, 1915 sailing day for Lusitania. D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation was playing on 42nd Street. Bloomingdale's was pushing pianolas, and the stores were promoting Blue Surge Week for men. Cunard was advertising too. Lusitania, the largest and fastest liner in Atlantic service, sails at 10 a.m. Beside it, a warning. Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain are liable to destruction. Travelers do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy.